Hi there. Welcome to the Life Hack Show. Life is full of limitations. Learn how to break free and live your best life. Join me, Ali Kramer, Content Director of Life Hack, as I interview the top experts in the self improvement sphere for advice on how to make life more enjoyable, no matter who you are. If you're looking for insight on how to overcome any obstacle, this podcast is made for you. Today, I'll be speaking with Dr. Kyler Shumway, Doctor of Clinical Psychology, author, public speaker, and advocate for the autism community. We'll be talking a bit about his book, The Friendship Formula, How to Say Goodbye to Loneliness and Discover Deeper Connection. He'll be sharing with us his own personal story of overcoming social anxiety and how he helps his clients become empowered to do the same. And he'll also share with us some great advice on how to strengthen your own friendships in life. Hi, Dr. Shumway. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Ali. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about this. Um, I have a couple questions that I'm eager to get answers to, and I think that this is going to be a really great show because, I mean, we're such social animals. We all seek and want friendships in our life, so really eager to hear your tips. Yeah, um, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Great. So I want to start off with a little bit about your background. Um, you're a doctor of clinical psychology. Yeah, it's important to note that I'm currently in the transition between my clinical internship and postdoctoral fellowship. Nice. Uh, so currently I'm not in clinic, but uh, previously I was working in a hospital setting and uh, doing, doing clinical work in, in, in that regard. So therapy, assessment, consultation, all that good stuff. Wonderful. So you, you have a lot of experience with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the way I like to say it is it's, it feels simultaneously like it went very quickly and I aged about a decade. Um, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> <laughs> somehow, right? <laughs> so have you always been interested in psychology? Um, I think I've always been interested. I just didn't know what it would look like. I see. Um, so, so for example, up until my freshman year of college, I firmly believed that I was going to be a film director. Um, so I, cool. I, I had such a passion for creating stories, making something that like spurred emotion and made people feel something. And I even won a few film competitions just to toot my own horn. It, wow. it was really fun. Uh, but uh, a lot of that changed once I actually started to study film and I, I took some cinematography classes in college. Um, the more I learned, the less I loved it. So the, the worst part was, as I started studying it and learning all of the filming and editing techniques, I noticed that the magic of enjoying a good movie started to go away. Uh-huh. So, uh, <laughs> but luckily, I had plan B, which was coaching, athletic coaching. Uh, I was a four-year Division One shot putter. Which, wow, you're kind of like a, a man of many talents. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, I guess for those of you who don't know what, what shot putting is, it's the event in track and field where you throw the big metal ball. Uh, in, in other words, I was really good at two things, throwing heavy stuff and eating like a horse. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a, a bit of my background. But I, I, I had a blast. I was also a coach uh, for football and for track. I even coached college for, for a while. Uh, but it didn't really feel like my work was making the kind of impact that I wanted to have on the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, I was doing things like helping kids learn how to do bench press and how to throw a perfect spiral, but, but something was missing. Right, right. And that's where psychology kind of came in. Yeah, well, it, it wasn't immediately. And, and, you know, honestly, I felt pretty lost for a while. I wasn't really sure which way my life was headed. I didn't really know where my calling was. And then psychology and psychotherapy entered my life. Um, and unlike film, uh, the more I learned, the more I fell in love. Uh -huh. It was like the perfect intersection of creativity, science, and impact on the world. I love that. That's, that's really very cool to hear. Um, so you're talking about it wasn't necessarily an easy transition. What challenges or setbacks did you face getting to where you are today? <laughs> um, so I, I'll talk about some of the ones that are probably most salient for our, our topic. Um, but these days I've got it a lot more down pat, especially now that I do so much public speaking. But it may surprise listeners to know that I've struggled with social anxiety disorder for most of my life. Mm -hmm. um, from an early age, I would do whatever it took to get out of anything that required me to be social because being around people, having to engage in conversation or being seen by others made me feel incredibly uncomfortable. I'd get like instantly nauseous, my heart would pound, my mind would race, I'd get all shaky. Um, and so like most people with social anxiety, I did my best to avoid social situations. Mm -hmm. uh, my my go-to tactic was actually to act like I was sick 
ah, and I would get really creative with this, Ali. What I, what I would do is I would take a bowl and I would fill it with random food ingredients and then I would go dump it in the toilet and then I would tell my parents, oh, look, I have, I have been sick. I am ill. I am not well enough to go to a sleepover or to school or wh- whatever it was that I was being required to go do. That's very uh, creative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, one, I remember there was this one fateful Sunday where uh, I became the boy who cried sick. Uh, and I was actually sick one morning. Oh no. I woke up and just felt miserable. And my mom uh, was was in the bathroom getting ready for church. And I went up to her and I was like, "Mom, I feel just miserable. I think I'm I'm sick for real this time." And she kind of like looked at me and she went, "Aw, oh we'll no, put on your church clothes. We're leaving soon." <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> a nightmare situation. Yeah, exactly. Especially for someone who's already kind of plagued with social anxiety. It's like the last thing you want to do is be sick in that situation. Absolutely. Um, long story short, what ended up happening was we were there at church uh, sitting in like the front row because my family was one of those people. And uh, I, I ended up just puking all over the place oh, in the congregation. <laughs> well, it shows them. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I really struggle with social anxiety. A, a lot of it came from my experiences of bullying. I see. I see. So it kind of started when you were younger. Um, at what point did you realize that it was actually social anxiety you were feeling? Did you ever feel that you were that this was something that other people experienced? Or did you kind of always know that this was something more or less unique to just a subset of other people? I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I'm, I'm trying to think back to, I, I remember feeling very alone in the social anxiety. Mm. I remember thinking that there's no way that other people are this way. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. Uh, nobody else gets it. And, and I think that a part of that was, I wasn't around other people who were, demonstrating the same kind of socially anxious behaviors that I felt. Right. Um, like so it, it was easy about, for everyone else to kind of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember uh, uh, thinking that, um, you know, like maybe if, if something's off with me, was I born the wrong way? Is there something mm-hmm. wrong with my brain? Um, you know, the, the typical things that most kids start to, to sure. wonder about when they're, when they're different. But, um, but that was just one of the things for me. So I was, I, you know, I was, was bullied quite a bit. I was a pretty easy target. Um, I was a chubby, socially awkward farm boy. And uh, I was, even though I was born a boy, I had these gorgeous long eyelashes. Maybe mm. he's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Um, but, nice. but I'm telling you, I was born with it. And I had these bullies that just made me feel absolutely miserable about myself. Uh, so those experiences actually, uh, spoiler alert, they, it ended up that I became a bully later in my own life. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's maybe a story for another time. Uh, but a big part of the work that I try to do now is helping both survivors and enactors of bullying. And I've actually got a book in the works right now specifically about this. So I'll have to, I'll have oh. to stay tuned. Yeah, that's really cool. So in a lot of ways, it's not too disconnected. I'm guessing, you know, even theater itself, I don't have any experience with theater. Although, disclaimer, I do have a fine arts background, which is, I have a very similar experience with you getting a little jaded from it once I was in it. Like, I, my, my love started to go away. And that's, that's actually when I went into um, psychology. But there is a connection there, yeah, like of, of communication and, and, you know, expression and all these things. Absolutely. I think uh, my fascination has always been with the emotional experience. Um, my own emotional experience, uh, it's, it's kind of been, yeah, we, we're talking a little bit about social anxiety. It's, it's kind of always been at the forefront for me. I, I, I've always kind of believed if I could just figure out the way through the anxiety, if I can just solve my anxiety problem, then suddenly I'll, I'll be this wonderful, amazing person and all of my life problems will, will kind of fade into the background. Uh, but anxiety is just one amongst an infinite spectrum of human, human emotion, mm-hmm. which is why I say the more that I began to study psychology, the more I fell in love with it. And also the more I learned, the less I knew. Uh, right. So it's the, it's just this fascinating final frontier in a lot of ways, uh, understanding um, the the inner psyche and understanding people's inner experiences. Uh, it's neat stuff. Yeah, it definitely is. So um, within your book, the friendship formula, um, there's there's a focus on on this on loneliness, right? Um, and I'm really fascinated with your thoughts on us facing a loneliness epidemic and your quest to help end it one friendship at a time. 
Can you elaborate for our listeners on what you mean? Yeah. Um, so so uh, just as a bit of background, there's been a great deal of research, particularly that's uh, it, most of it's done these days by Dr. Holt Lundstad. Uh, the research indicates that despite the social media and other technology at our fingertips, loneliness and isolation may be more prevalent today than it's ever been. Uh, some of the latest studies indicate that around somewhere in the neighborhood of 45% of adults in the U.S. report feeling lonely and disconnected from others. Oh, that's so sad. 45%. It's unreal. Yeah. Uh, and this isn't just in the U.S. We know that the numbers are similar in places like the U.K. and Canada, and, and it's actually higher in places like Japan and China. So, it, and it's not just right. enough to know that loneliness is prevalent, because this also comes with consequences, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so, for example, there was a study in 2015 that suggested that social disconnection might be just as deadly as morbid obesity or smoking. Um, so there's an increased risk of death at 26% for reported loneliness. That's, that's incredible. Um, although not very surprising, I guess, thinking about how important relationships are to so many people. I mean, like songs are written about love and friendship and movies and books and kind of any stories that we want to ingest as human beings are kind of focused around this idea of socialization. Um, and, and, and so is this something that, uh, how did you get to the point where you were writing, writing the friendship formula? Um, so, so I think part of what led to this was a, a sudden fascination with this idea. So the, the, the craziest part about the loneliness epidemic is that it doesn't have to do with the number of connections you have or the people around you per se, mm-hmm. as we know there are people who live completely alone and they're, they're, they're happy. Uh, with it. But instead, this is, this is about one's perception of loneliness, one's like emotional experience of being left out, disconnected, or rejected. Um, so, and, and as you were uh, uh, pointing to, these, these feelings have roots that go way back before the dawn of, of up, upright rock walking humans, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we evolved to learn that togetherness and belonging it were pretty essential for survival. Uh, like those who get left out also get eaten or they starve to death. Uh, so we're so hardwired for relationship. And just like any other survival instinct, like hunger or thirst, when those needs go unmet, we, we really suffer. That's um, interesting. And so when we suffer, we try to make ourselves feel better by numbing ourselves with like food and drink and technology. And so hence the increased death risk and health problems and all that stuff. Um, so th- that's really what I, I mean when I'm talking about the loneliness epidemic. Yeah. And part of what I'm trying to do with the work that I do through speaking and writing is to, to push back against that a little bit. My hope is eventually I want to work myself out of a job um, mm-hmm. so that eventually we'll live in a world where people belong and and nobody feels left out. Hmm. Uh, But I think we have quite a ways to go before that happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to start somewhere and thank goodness you're, you're doing it. That's really great. So what can our listeners find in the friendship formula? Absolutely. So there are too many friendship books out there that are all about just making connections, Mm -hmm. like how to do small talk, how to host a party, how to act when you're at a bar. Uh, But few of them actually teach you how to actually be in a relationship. Mm. So I wrote the friendship formula to kind of go beyond the social tricks and the gimmicks to use what clinical psychology actually says about developing a healthy friendship. Mm -hmm. So specifically, the friendship formula helps people take care of themselves and understand other people so that when they actually do find and have opportunity for a relationship, they'll, they'll be ready. Interesting. Um, That's, that's great. So do you have any solid advice that you could share with our audience um, about cultivating better friendships? Yeah. Um, So think of it this way. If you were going to meet your best friend or your lifelong partner, you name it today, would they want to be connected with you? If the answer is no, that means you might not be at your best emotionally, psychologically, interpersonally. And if you don't know how to nurture and strengthen a relationship over time, then even if you're good at making initial connections, none of them will endure. Mm -hmm. So if you can understand and take care of yourself, and if you can understand and take care of others, the rest follows suit. Gotcha. Got so self care is first to make sure that you're the, they're the you're the best version of you before you try to add others into the mix. I think they kind of happen at the same time. Um, gotcha. 
let me explain this a little bit. So uh, firstly, let's consider this. If roughly half the population is lonely, that means that you're not alone in your loneliness. Mm -hmm. There are people right there, maybe sitting next to you in class or at work, who are starving for human connection. And if you know that somebody next to you was actually physically starving, you would almost certainly offer to share whatever food you had, even if you were just as hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, but unlike food, friendship is an unlimited resource. So what you want to do is look to the margins. You want to look for people who sit alone in the cafeteria, who might be shy or awkward, and try extending the hand of friendship. Uh -huh. uh, that really gives you the best chance of success of making an initial connection. Um, and it also helps make the world a little less lonely. Like um, but, but, but as I mentioned earlier, you, you do need to prioritize yourself and your own health. And this kind of goes back to the old self-care adage about how when you're on an airplane, you need to put on your own oxygen mask before you try and help others. Mm -hmm. um, but the best way to have the best relationship is to be your best self in that relationship. Gotcha. Um, so if, if you can't be present with another person because you're so overwhelmed and stressed out, they are not going to enjoy that much uh, time around you. If you're constantly complaining and venting and unloading negativity on other people because you have no other outlet, that's going to affect how much other people like you. Mm -hmm. But if you can take care of yourself and be self-sufficient, it gives you more space to invest in your relationships. So it improves the chances of being successful and creating a healthy bond. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it often, um, you see a lot of people out there in the world seeking re relationships, particularly romantic ones, where they are trying to complete themselves um, through somebody else or, or, or make themselves a better version of themselves through adding someone else into the mix. And that seems like a, a pretty much a recipe for disaster. I, I think it can be, you know, I, I, for some reason, what came to mind for me as you were sharing that, Ali, was the, uh, the, the, the song from the movie Frozen, where they're like, <laughs> he's a bit of a fixer upper. And I, 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 I do believe that that song has some good truth. Like, I, I do believe that relationship can provide healing. Mm -hmm. I do believe that, that people can make each other stronger and iron sharpens iron and all that good stuff. But if you're, if you're really looking to improve your chances in relationship, it helps to not be uh, plastic in the iron versus iron scenario. It helps to to be able to uh, hold your own and, and be self-sufficient. So that way the other person feels like they can rely on you sometimes. And that makes for a reciprocal relationship and something that lasts the, the, the test of time. Yeah, that's really beautifully put. I like that. Um, so uh, I'm thinking about, you know, you as uh, a child and now how you're presenting <laughs> now where you seem very charismatic. Uh, you, you know, who did you have role models in your life leading up to, to this that you look to or do you still have role models that have helped inspire you to um, kind of be an advocate for friendship? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about my main one. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it feels a little bit cheesy, but uh, Fred Rogers. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I grew up watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Mr. Rogers is always just going to hold this special place in my heart. Uh, it, it, it wasn't until I became an adult, uh, which I'm still working on, by the way, uh, that I <laughs> learned the incredible impact that Mr. Rogers has had on the world, mm -hmm. um, way beyond his TV show. Um, so if you ever want to read a book and cry a whole lot, you can check out Tim Madigan's I'm Proud of You, uh, mm -hmm. which gives just the most amazing, beautiful account of the, the kind of love that Mr. Rogers offered other people. Oh, that's wonderful. I yeah, like it, that. It's just a glorious book. Uh, he, he also uh, was just a huge advocate for saying all people have worth and value, that everyone deserves connection. Um, and he kind of dedicated his whole life to making sure other people knew that. Mm -hmm. So if, if the work I do has even the kind of, uh, like a fraction of the sort of impact he had, I'm going to die a happy man. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, it's, it's hard to deny the impact that he had. I know I grew up watching uh, Mr. Rogers and I always felt so good afterwards <laughs> watching, watching his show. The other, I, I feel like he's kind of also the spirit animal of the, the wandering uh, searcher for a career path. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if uh, you're the sort of person who's like, oh, I kind of feel drawn to this field, but I also kind of like this thing, and I don't know what I want to do with my life. Uh, there, there was once a person who started off, I think, I think it was as a puppeteer, 
and then he became a singer, and then he became a screenwriter, and that man was Mr. Rogers. And, uh -huh. and he put together, like, like all of his pursuits, his life pursuits came together to be this beautiful thing. Uh, and I think that gives encouragement for other people who might sort of feel like they're, they're just kind of wandering and they don't know which direction they're heading in yet. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, you know, at Lifehack, we talk a lot about um, kind of habits and routines and, and kind of uh, change, shifting mindsets and such uh, as a crucial component of how we each live our own lives. Um, can you tell me about kind of your own experience day to day? Do you actively try to cultivate new connections on a daily basis? I, so um, let me think about this. I want to give you a good answer. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the short answer to your question is yes, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's different than you might think. So being open to and willing to engage in a relationship and sort of having your, uh, my door is open, always open policy is kind of the way that I lead things. So I'm the sort of person who's always open to and, and willing to receive connection when, when I see people who are in need of it, when I see people who I, I want to be in relationship with. So I, I keep my door very open. Uh, but I, I had somebody once describe me as an introvert who really deeply craves human connection. Hmm. So it, it takes a lot out of me to go out and, and socialize and uh, uh, go to a, a big social event. A, a big part of that is my social anxiety. It still will come up anytime I'm, I'm in that kind of setting. Uh, so what I have to do is, is sort of the same thing that people with chronic pain have to do. And what people with chronic pain have to do is they have to prioritize what am I going to accomplish in any given day that's, that I know is going to sap my resources and how can I kind of plan and prioritize so that I can get through it all so I can, I can accomplish what I need to. So I have to be kind of selective with how I engage socially so that I can be as present as I can be with the people who are in my life. Uh, so I, I think that, that uh, one way to think about it would be I'm, I'm sort of picky with my time and I try and make the most of my connections when I, when I have the chance. That's wonderful. I mean, just to hear, I completely understand as an introvert myself, it'll zap you <laughs> if you're yeah. engaging too much and you need that to have that recharge moment. Um, but it's really wonderful to kind of hear that it, despite, you know, this was such a huge limitation in your life so long ago, you haven't actually like just completely gotten rid of it. It's, it's still there. You, and, and it really kind of um, speaks to the fact that we always should be working on ourselves to improve ourselves. But even if we have some sort of setback or limitation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can fix it and make it go away, but you kind of have to embrace it and work with it. And that sounds like what you're doing. It's so true. Uh, in The Princess Bride, where we have the, the scene, I hope this isn't a spoiler because the movie came out forever ago, but we have the scene where uh, our hero Wesley is, is engaging in the trials. He's defeating uh, our three uh, uh, mini bosses and he, get, he comes to, I, I'm forgetting his name, but he's the one that does the poison goblets. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, he, 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 he starts the game and he knows exactly what he's gonna do and he, he drinks the goblet and he survives and he had just poisoned both of the glasses, right? Instead of mm -hmm. trying to, to do the mental problem solving of, of figuring it out. And he says that he's been sort of consuming poison throughout his career as a pirate so that he can do that, right? So when that moment comes and he needs to consume the poison, he's not going to die. And I kind of think of my social anxiety that same way. Like I know yeah. I just keep ingesting a little bit of that weird uh, discomfort that comes with social engagement, then I'm going to be able to do what I need to do day to day. But I also fully believe, Ali, that if I ever was in like uh, uh, a marooned island scenario for a year, it would all come back. Like if I, <laughs> if I was isolated from people for a whole year, I think I would, I would be pretty close back to square one. Like granted, I've got some skills for coping with anxiety, but part of it really does, like there's a reason why uh, therapists will use exposure therapy yeah. For, yeah. for anxiety. It really does work. It, it, it impacts you on a neurological level. So there's, there's something to that. Uh, so keep taking your poison if you're one of those people like me. Uh, so that way you can, you can go on the big adventures. <laughs> that's a that's a really cool way to think about it like that. Um, anything else you want to share about your book, The Friendship Formula? 
Um, I think if what I've been sharing uh, with you, Ali, and with our listeners, if, if any of these things are resonating with you and you want to learn more, you should really just consider checking out the book. Definitely. Uh, I wrote it for you guys. I wrote it for anybody as young as middle school, uh, but I've had readers who are like in the middle of lonely retirement contact me and say, hey, why didn't you write this when I was younger? <laughs> oh, wow. That's so, great. Yeah. There's a lot of people experiencing that. I know that we get letters all the time talking about the, the, the feeling of loneliness right as they hit retirement because maybe their, their work was their only so, social life or, or such. So that's great. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so if you do decide to give it a read, please let me, let me know what you think. Uh, you can contact me through my website at kylershumway.com. Uh, you can also find the friendship formula. It's listed on Amazon. Uh, so it's pretty easy to search. If you just search for friendship formula, it'll, it'll come right up. Uh, and, and if you do give it a read, please consider giving me a review. Uh, it really does help other people see that it's out there and that it's useful. Uh, That's wonderful. Yeah, I definitely encourage everyone to check it out. We'll include links um, within the podcast description itself on YouTube and within our own blog posts. So you can easily access that. And again, um, check out Dr. Shumway's website at www.kylershumway. That's K-Y-L-E-R-S-H-U-M-W-A-Y.com. That wraps up today's show. And thank you all for joining and stay tuned for the next episode.